Some of you will remember that I was here two years ago, and it's so nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Thank you for inviting me back. And thank you for giving me this platform to share my thoughts on recurring and pressing issues in this industry. Because there remain powerful global players with vested interests in the status quo. They would like us to believe that all is well in the supply chain, especially in the garment workers' world. Well, that sadly is not the case. If you weren't here, my heated and somewhat colorful exchange on living wages with brand representatives here is preserved for posterity in the true cost, the beautiful documentary that Andrew Morgan did on the impact of this industry. Ideally, two years on, we will be looking at a reform industry, wondering why we ever needed to debate essential rights. Well, tragically, we remain very far from that position. I return today to report that there has not been substantial change in this industry. I return to this platform today because we cannot and we must not draw a veil over the death of 1,334 garment workers in Bangladesh, especially when major brands move on across the world to Cambodia, to Myanmar, to Ethiopia, exporting exactly the same model without systemic change. That was not the agreement. That was not the intention. And that is certainly cannot be the sum total of our ambition. So we found today here, as advertised, attending the world's largest conference on sustainability and fashion. Sounds impressive, doesn't it? But remember, size and might do not equal systemic change. It takes much more than that. So it's simply not enough to tick the box, to say we came, we listened politely, and that's it. Because that will leave us in the same position we are here today. Nearly three years ago, some of the biggest brands in the world committed to improving working conditions by signing the Bangladesh Accord on fire and building safety. Three years on, and despite growing profits and market shares, some of those brands have still not made the strategic supply factory safe. The sad, sad fact is, this industry remains more comfortable picking low-hanging fruit by focusing on token green initiatives than on dealing with human exploitation in the supply chain. If you in your heart like me believe that this is not an acceptable position, I ask you to be more courageous. And that starts with the elephant in the room. Nothing, nothing will ever change until the business model of fast fashion stays as it is. And that is producing huge volumes of clothes in incredibly fast cycles and very, very cheaply. That is, by continuing to addict us to an even crazier cycle of consumption, which is totally unsustainable in itself. And I was very grateful that this elephant in the room of the business model was addressed this morning by Her Royal Highness Princess Mary, the Minister Kristen Jensen, and Mary Ridgway of Patagonia. You are going to hear the word sustainable countless of times during the summit. So many times, in fact, that is in danger of becoming meaningless. But the word sustainable does mean something. It is enshrined as part of the sustainable development goals, and we must not forget this. Sustainable goal number eight is to promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. Now, I hear development banded around this industry almost as much as I hear the word sustainable. But let me tell you that the fast fashion version of development, and this is me being charitable, slightly lacks credibility. It is growth masquerading as development, and we should not be fooled by this. 
Of course, it's not just sustainable development goals that the global community has decided are fundamental to people and planet. I would imagine that most of us here believe in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is, after all, one of the greatest international agreements ever made. As Hannah Arendt puts it, it's the right to rights. Well, let me read you some parts of Article 23. Everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work. Everyone without any discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work, ensuring for himself, and most importantly in this industry, herself, and their families an existence worthy of human dignity. Everyone has the right to form and join trade unions for the protection of their interests. So how do you feel when you hear on the news that the nation state has violated this declaration? I suspect, let me, you feel sick to the stomach because we do not buy the idea that these enshrined rights can be manipulated or that there are special cases when it's okay to ignore them. Well, fashion, our industry, is certainly not a special case. So I would ask to view this industry through this lens. When you do, it is absolutely clear that we can only accept systemic change. Through this lens, we can see real opportunities because this industry, with its whirling supply chains and millions of contributors across the world, is bursting with possibility. I hardly need to stress this when so many of you here are familiar with sizing system, but it's not one size fits all opportunity, like we're often led to believe, especially by the mega brands who are taking over our high streets. It will be easier, it's true, to accept the status quo, to believe the growth first model as a solution, but it's time to acknowledge that the current model with a few band-aids cannot really deliver the change that we need. We must cut through this noise. Because the impact, the pace, the volume, the economics preordained by this current business model will not get us to the point we want to get to. One where producers are in partnership with brands, not in servitude to them. And in the interest <laughs> and in the interest of cutting through that noise, I partner with the Lawyer Circle, a powerful organization of lawyers, on a new initiative to establish legal accountability in this sector. We will soon publish a study, a study that will set out the legal case for a living wage as a fundamental human right, a study that will explore the legal options for setting a global standard for a living wage. For those in this industry, so many of you here, who are willing to be courageous. I hope that this study will give you the architecture to build the change that we dream of. And for all of us in civil society, as European Commissioner Mr. Biankowska reminded us, it's time for us to be active citizens, to be active consumers. We can't demand for change unless we stop the cycle of thoughtless consumption that the fast fashion brands have dictated to us. We can't. So next time we have this conversation, <laughs> next time we have this conversation, I know it will be different. Thank you.